Thank you for the introduction. Um, the good news is I survived the pre-conference dinner with only minor stains from my uh, from my dinner, uh, so that was uh, that was appreciated. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is a project that I started about five years ago. Um, the first year was very much about research. Um, and then the following four years, it was all about taking it into the ocean and uh, you know turning it into action. Um, learning that John Burt is coming next month makes me feel a little bit like a warm-up act, because uh, he is definitely Mr. Coral in the Middle East. Uh, we have worked with him as well. Um, what I'm going to do to begin with is, because uh, I wasn't really sure about the um, the background and uh, you know knowledge in terms of ocean stuff within the group, so I'm going to go through some of the what some of you might consider to be more basic things first, and then we'll sort of since we're talking about the ocean drift into the uh, the actual project itself. How many people here get underwater dive or? Yeah, obviously we have a few. Okay, cool. Um, so you'll probably recognize quite a few of the things that I'll be showing you. Uh, it's a very visual presentation, and what I will do is, is voice over more or less, depending on your appetite. Um, if anybody has any questions, then you know, pop your hand up if it's a quick question. Otherwise, keep it on your section of questions at the end. So um, the talk is all about building quarries to increase biodiversity. Um, um, Okay. All right, it doesn't look like the point is working. So, there we are. All right, so as we all know, we live on a blue planet. Uh, not everybody appreciates the fact that the planet is actually regulated by the ocean. Um, all of the ocean water, sorry, all of the um, the warming effects and stuff that we're uh, we're experiencing, you know, year on year, um, are essentially uh, being uh, slowed down by the ocean as best it can. But it's getting a little bit overwhelmed. Um, Seventy-one percent of the Earth is covered in water, which represents a huge number: one point three five billion trillion liters of water. Um, it's quite impressive. That was. Brilliant timing. 1.35 billion trillion liters of water, and we get a fanfare. I love it. Um, so, without the ocean, we would look like Mars. There literally wouldn't be anything on the planet. We wouldn't have any wildlife or natural history to talk about. So, it's very important that we look after it. Um, now, as we all know, being naturalists, all life relies on plants that use the sun's energy. And that's also true in the ocean. Um, the majority of marine life is, is found in the shallow areas, the coastal areas. Um, and that's because that's where light can actually reach the life underneath it. And that's why within the tropical regions, this is where we find the hotspots for reef. It's very, very rare that we find deep reefs. Um, the reefs exist within the depth that they can get sufficient sunlight to be able to um, you know, create energy, essentially. So um, that becomes quite important when we get to the project a little bit later. Um, we can think of the coral reefs as, uh, as the cities of the oceans. Um, if we take the topo topography of our coastal areas here, and I'm specifically talking about the east coast of the UAE, so that's the Indian Ocean coast, uh, rather than the Arabian Sea. Um, it's characterized by small areas of lots of life, so rocky pinnacles with reefs and stuff around them, interspersed with long tracts of pretty much barren sand. What we'll find in the sand is quite a lot of benthic life, worms and stuff like that, but it's pretty rare that we see species other than those uh, crustaceans, um, worms, etc. Um, the fish that you'll see in those areas will be transitory um, and they'll be going from one place to another or they'll be sort of general, out there generally hunting as it were, more oceanic uh, type of species. So, I don't know if you realize this, but coral reefs are actually the nurseries 
or depending on which science paper you read and how much credibility you give to the estimates, between 25 and 35 percent of marine life. Now, that doesn't sound a lot, does it? 25 to 35 percent, it's not a lot really. However, if you turn that into absolute terms, number of species, that is about the same as the number of species you find in the Amazonian rainforest. Okay, to put it into context, it's a lot. So, does anyone here know what coral is? Is coral an animal or a vegetable, a mineral, um, a plant? What is it? Does anyone know? You were listening when I was talking before, weren't you? It's half plant and half animal. So, coral is actually an animal that's similar to a jellyfish. And what happens is it gets colonized inside it by in a symbiotic relationship by something called zooxanthellae, okay, which is an algae. Now, we've all seen these beautiful corals and um, nasty coral necklaces that I don't like. But anyway, um, we've seen red corals and green corals and blue corals and mm -hmm. mostly brown corals as well. That is actually the algae that gives it the color, okay? Otherwise, it would be transparent or, or white. And we'll come on to why that's important in just a second. So during the day, algae feeds the coral. Okay, so it's, it's photosynthesizing, it's producing energy, it's producing sugar, uh, and it's feeding the animal, okay? The animal can feed itself, which it typically does at night, okay? And it will then, as all animals do, it will be food in, poop out, and the algae will be nourishing itself from that, okay? So very much a symbiotic relationship. Now, what happens as they grow is that they create exoskeletons of calcium carbonate chalk. And that's what creates all these fascinating shapes that we see, you know, these sort of big flat shapes, brain shapes, tree shapes. Uh, there, there are lots and lots of different types of coral. And you can see a few examples here. Um, and that is what creates these sort of huge infrastructures that we call collectively a reef, coral reef. Okay, so we've got colonies of coral that grow into reefs as a collective, collective noun, I suppose you could call it. Now, the structures, as I mentioned, grow into all sorts of different shapes and forms. And that then creates habitat for all of the animals that come and live in the reef. Okay, and obviously different creatures would like to be in different habitats. You know, some of them want an overhead environment. Some of them are tiny creatures that want lots of branches that they can swim in and out of to avoid larger predators. Um, and essentially that becomes you know, a safe space, if you like, for the different types of marine life to live and thrive in. Um, the other thing that coral reefs do is to actually provide a food system. So we were talking about this just before the talk. Um, coral typically prefers to live in nutrient-free waters. You know, the clearer and, and more nutrient-free, the more the coral appreciates it. It doesn't like nutrients that much. Um, we have a bit of an exceptional environment here where we do actually have quite a nutrified um, sort of coastline uh, with lots and lots of algae and macroalgae and stuff like that. But somehow, our corals adapted to, uh, to deal with that. But in an environment where there is no food, no nutrients, coral will actually create that basic ecosystem that attracts other animals that then creates a food chain. That's kind of interesting. And we get lots of wonderful creatures on our, uh, on our reefs, you know, octopus. Um, we get lots of crustaceans, crabs and shrimps. In fact, uh, many of these actually perform services to the reef. So we have lots of little porcelain crabs, and uh, they're not really proper, proper crabs, but they look like them. And their goal is to go and clean all the coral that they feed. Um, so roughly globally, if you look at all the coral reefs globally, about 25,000 25, different species of fish have been identified as well that live well, basically a born breed and live around the coral reef ecosystems, okay? Now, 
That is extremely important as a number because particularly in countries like the UAE where fish protein is actually a major food source for humans, um, the reef there be therefore becomes massively important in terms of producing a nursery area for those fish to breed and for the, you know, the numbers to be sufficient to support fishing. Um, we are in a situation in a where situation they're, where they're probably on probably overfishing sort of status at this point in time, and we need more fish. And the only way we're going to do that is by having more habitat. Um, coral reefs perform that service. Mangroves also perform that service. Seagrass performs that service, uh, service rather. But in our East Coast environment, we don't have many mangroves, and seagrass is sort of fleeting. We have it blooming for short periods of time and then it gets essentially washed away by a surge and, and waves and stuff the rhizomes stay but the shoots don't uh, but obviously we have nemo as well i thought i'd throw that one in there got lots of them um so um as we all know i'm sure coral reefs are under threat if you've been watching the news um last year was disastrous in florida um we have the first El Nino um, climatic system that is running since three years. We've had El Ninas before for the last three years. And for those of you, so I'm going to simplify it because it's quite a complex topic, but um, for those of you who are not familiar with El Nino and El Nino in terms of details, and El Nino is basically when the ocean um, absorbs heat, and El Nino is basically when it releases it again. Okay, so that then means that the atmosphere heats up, the surface of the sea or the ocean heats up as well. Um, and that started off on the southeast area, uh, area of uh, Australia last year, made its way around as um, you know overheated seawater to Florida and that coastline and basically took out about between 80 and 90% of the coral air last year. Um, now, it got to the point where, I mean, some of my colleagues and, and, and good friends who are over there, they were removing coral from the sea and putting it in, uh, in tanks on land so that they could, uh, you know, maintain the temperature that the coral could survive. And um, they're now replanting it back in again. Uh, but, you know, there were significant losses. Last year in the UAE, we also had significant losses, mainly in the Arabian Sea, um, <laughs> in the Abu Dhabi end of the country, the water got to 38 degrees um, for a number of weeks. I can't be sure exactly how many weeks, but I think it was four, five, six weeks, depending on depth. Now, our coral um, in this area survives comfortably up to about 32, 32.5 degrees, according to the studies that have been done so far. Um, when it gets above 32, 32.5 for a couple of days, the coral will get a little bit sweaty, but it won't mind too much. If it goes for a week, a week and a half, two weeks, then we start to see signs of distress on the reef. Um, and I'll come into what that looks like in just a second. And there are two reasons why these, you know, these this damage is occurring. Uh, the, the first is, you know, climate change. The ocean is warming and you know there are there are many charts available to show quite dramatic increases in ocean temperature and the thing is that in the ocean um, a 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 degree change has an impact a significant impact whereas you know if we're on land well 0.1 or 0.2 degree of, of change is not that significant in the ocean it is We've also obviously got rising pollution and eutrophication, as I mentioned before, which is uh, also damaging the corals. Um, ocean acidification is increasing generally. And since corals are made of calcium carbonate, chalk, when you put acid on chalk, it doesn't work out too well. Um, so, you know, that's making the exoskeletons more fragile as well in certain cases. Um, so, the last point is coastal construction. Uh, we've obviously had a lot of coastal construction in this in this country, in this, this region. And that also increases the amount of sedimentation that gets into the water. Now, corals are very much like plants. And as I was kind of semi-joking when we were uh, sort of talking before, 
If you were in a garden and you took a rose bush and then either threw a whole bunch of dirt over the top of it or put it in a box, you wouldn't expect it to grow very fast. Same is true of coral. If we start getting a lot of sand and sediment growing on top of the coral, stresses it out, makes it use a huge amount of energy to try and get rid of this. And if it can't, then it can't photosynthesize. If it can't photosynthesize, it will starve over a period of time. So that's another big one. Now, the rising temperatures I mentioned before are what cause mostly coral bleaching. You've probably all heard of coral bleaching. And you probably all put the pieces together now from the other different parts at the start of the talk. We start off with colored coral. Why is it colored? Because it's got these anthella inside it. Um, it's algae and the color of the algae gives us a color. When we get to a certain temperature, I've got a slide on this, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but when we get to a certain temperature, we're gonna start experiencing bleaching. Bleaching doesn't mean say it's dead, okay? It can come back. But if we can't affect what we need to to make it come back, then we'll end up with dead coral. And that looks very much like this brown, brittle rubble. Now, healthy coral, we've got the coral, we've got the algae feeding each other, looking after each other. Everything's lovely and colorful. When it gets too hot, basically what happens the algae leaves the coral, it's expelled by the animal. Get out of here. Okay, at which point it loses its color? Bleaching. Okay, but it's not dead yet. The animal's still alive and the animal can still feed itself during the night. However, it's now on half rations. Now, when you're on half rations, you get sick more easily. And so they become more fragile and more prone to disease and you know other, other issues. So if they can survive long enough for the temperature to drop, they can actually reacquire those algae, the Susan Thelly. Okay, they, they can actually uh, come back. And one of the things that we do from a reef um, repair perspective is when we get areas that are bleached and the temperature drops back down to something a little bit more reasonable within a sufficiently short period of time, what we will do is actually plant the same species of healthy coral within the bleached area. And so far we've noticed that we sort of get a 50-50 success rate in terms of that repropagating the zoos and that are out into the, the damaged corals, which is good, better than zero. So <clears throat> the thing is, is that if the coral dies, then the rest of the reef goes with it. Okay, I mean, this would be the equivalent of um, Dubai still having tower blocks and villas and shops and everything else, but no food. How long would we stay here as humans? Probably not that long. We'd probably want to go somewhere where there was something better to eat. So the denizens of the reef depart once it's dead. Okay, you might get a few odd fish swimming around, but it's generally pretty dead after that. So what we're doing at Project Reframe is designed to protect and extend the, the reefs for all the reasons that we've just talked about. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, there are vast tracts of barren sand that we can operate on. And essentially what we're trying to do in the same way that, you know, we started off with, uh, with, with pearl fishing huts in Dubai and ended up with this, what we want to do is to start off with barren sand and end up with beautiful corals. So what we need to do is to lay the foundations. Now, coral needs something hard to grow on. And again, I'll expand on this as we go through. So that's one of the key things that we need to do is create substrate for the coral to be able to do its thing. So the project reframe objectives are to design, test, and deploy an artificial reef ecosystem um, through using man-made structures. Um, we use ocean-friendly structure uh, materials, which I'll go through in a second. Um, and essentially, that's to create and populate new substrate that coral can grow on, where before it was just sand where coral couldn't grow. Um, to create new habitat by doing that, and by creating new habitat to create 
increase the local fish stocks, reef animals, plant life that typically surround a coral reef. Coral naturally provides several other services, one of them being coastal protection. So coral, when it's sufficiently established, is capable of taking the power of waves out before it hits the coast. So, you know, if you look at where we're operating up on the East Coast, um, every year we have six or seven pretty violent storms. Uh, at the moment, there isn't really a, a barrier reef or anything over there. So, you know, storms come howling in and they'll take the beach and half the hotel furniture with them as they howl out again. It's an economic cost. Um, putting coral in can help to mitigate some of those issues. And lastly, and to me, probably almost as important, it's to create and educate a community of uh, conservationists. Um, one of the big things that we did manage to do during the, uh, the lockdown was to create a full education system that goes from six-year-olds all the way up to university interns who want to come over and do coral, you know, tropical coral reef studies and stuff like that, um, as well as citizen scientists that want to get involved and come along and help us do coral gardening, which is great fun, by the way. I enjoy it. Very therapeutic. Um, so the project's designed to, first of all, be funded by private investment and sponsorships. So I spend a proportion of my time going out and talking to people about, or different companies about the stuff that we're doing. And we've been fortunate enough uh, within our sort of CSR-driven environment in, uh, in the UAE um, to get quite a few sort of companies that have helped to pay for the, the work that we're doing um, in return for reporting and statistics and pictures and videos and the, all the other stuff that we produce as part of the science project. Um, we also ensure that we are creating as far as we possibly can only positive impacts. Um, so we avoid any pollutants, we avoid any materials that might actually cause leaching of chemicals into the water that change the, uh, the chemical composition of the ocean. Um, it's designed, as I mentioned, to recruit, train, and involve community of local people, corporates, and citizens, and also to promote conservation out on the uh, the Fajera coast. So those are the sort of big line project objectives. Um, I mentioned coral planular larva, so basically baby coral. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but coral can reproduce in two ways. So it reproduces sexually once a year. Um, and there's this sort of um, arcane calculation that we try to use to work out when that will be. It's not very precise, but um, we can generally anticipate which week it's going to occur. Uh, and then basically all the coral goes blur, and you have larvae everywhere, millions and millions and millions of larvae floating through the water column. And what they're looking for is something to attach to. Now, in our environment, obviously, when we've got lots and lots of desert between places that don't have a lot of rock, that have rock, rather, um, it can float a long time. Possibly it's going to get eaten. They're quite tasty, apparently, for certain species. Um, it'll get eaten before it actually attaches. Um, so we've got large areas of the coastlands I mentioned before that have very favorable conditions for coral. I mean, the coral grows when we plant it on, uh, on, on hard substrate. Um, but it's sand and it won't grow on sand. So by creating these artificial structures, uh, essentially what we're doing is providing, think of it like in the same way that you dig a, a big hole and pour concrete in it as a foundation. That's what we're doing. And then what we're doing is using corals and their abilities as what we call an ecosystem architect to create the buildings, the habitats. Okay. So by doing that, you know, as long as we look after the coral and make sure that it grows well, we can actually create, in quote, um, a new city underwater, which will then attract inhabitants. So we build artificial reefs. Now, there's lots of different ways you can build artificial reefs. Um, and I was mentioning before the, uh, the talk, uh, when we first started, we were fortunate and unfortunate to create our first structures, which were made out of metal. We welded them all up with lots of love. Um, we put them into the ocean, and two months later, Cyclone Shaheen hit us. 
And the score after that one was Cyclone Shaheen 10, Project Reframe 0. It literally destroyed all of our structures. And so we had to go back to the drawing board and work out a better way to build these things so they'd be far more robust. So we learned a lot out of that. But subsequently, we managed to produce a number of, um, I think we're, we're probably close to 100 structures at this point in time, built and or sunk, that um, have taken all shapes and sizes. So we've got um, a stingray here. You'll see some other ones as we go through. Uh, we try to do sort of animals and, and stuff like that, but some companies want their logo. I've just done one for Sony that is actually a, a PS5 and two controllers, which is absolutely amazing. So we've got three meter long controllers with a PS5 unit. Um, we have everything. And once we've done that, we can then attach corals that we've collected um, onto those structures and then obviously garden them, nurture them, make sure that they're free of predators, free of disease, free of algae that's covering them up. If they get sedimented, we'll clean them off. So just looking after them, basically. Um, so what starts as a bare frame, and this was this was a beautiful octopus. It's one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's about, I think, six meters long, um, with all your tentacles and everything. It looks lovely. Um, put it down, and you know, a year later, it's now covered, both in coral and other, um, you know, sort of other 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 plants and stuff like that. And we do garden it to make sure that the competition between the coral and the plants is managed for the initial part of the um, uh, of the project, because until we've built a balanced ecosystem around the reef, we'll actually end up with more plants than there are herbivores to actually eat it and naturally keep it trimmed. You know, it's like if you have, if you're a farmer and you have meadows, then put sheep in it because then you don't need to buy a lawnmower, right? It's, uh, it's kind of the same here. Um, over time, because there's food, we've measured that, you know, we do get the various sort of uh, you know, herbivore species, typical reef species that, start to um, to breed and to uh, to increase in numbers. And there's a sort of tipping point where they become the lawnmowers and we don't have to um, you know do quite so much work. What's going on again? There we are. Yeah, and, and essentially it becomes a living part of the uh, the environment after that. Now all of our structures are designed, so we build them out of, um, typically out of rebar or iron um, angle bar. The reason we chose that material is because uh, iron is a natural constituent, chemical constituent of the ocean. And we've tested over a two year period to see whether the amount of iron that we put in the water changes the chemical balance of that local environment. It doesn't, um, you know, we've got 1.35 million, billion, trillion, zillion gallons of water. And apparently our um, little structures aren't quite enough to uh, to make any sort of nasty changes. So we're happy with that. Um, and all the structures are actually designed to collapse at a certain point. So if we think back to what I was saying before, you know, we've got barren sand um, and we need to create hard substrate what happens is, so we create these frames, we put the coral onto it, and over a period of N years, depending on which species we're talking about, some grow faster than others, we could very easily end up with, um, you know, eight, nine, 10 square meters of coral. Uh, and if you consider how much calcium carbonate that is, it's quite heavy. Obviously, at a certain point, the metal will start to fatigue as well. And at that point, it will go boom. However, the coral foot will be high enough to stand proud of the sand so that it can now actually survive as a new reef. So the idea is that all our beautiful structures have a finite life and that they will intentionally collapse and will be left with natural reef. Now, we discovered something when we were doing phase one um, because of all this cyclone Shaheen uh, chaos and destruction, we were looking for ways to um, better attach the structures to the floor. And so we started digging 
And about 10 centimeters under the sand of our first site, we found solid substrate. So we started to have a bit of a look. Turns out it was an ancient reef that got buried, sedimented. Now, that got us curious. So we wanted to know, was this just a little patch or is this something that sort of spread further? And we started to investigate where it was going. And what we worked out, what we at least have a hypothesis of at this point, is that probably it was a barrier reef. Not as large and impressive as the, the Australian barrier reef, but it was probably a coastal barrier reef. And so we've been slowly sort of mapping out how far this goes. And what we've worked out is that the small patch reefs that are visible under the water, so these are sort of you know, rocky outcrops, seem to fall in a line, which would suggest to us that our theory might have some legs. So I'll come on to why that's important in a little while when we start talking about future phases of the projects. Um, but we used to have a barrier reef. Isn't that cool? We may still have one. Wait. <laughs> So I mentioned um, the materials. Um, we typically use steel, we use glass, uh, and we use Portland concrete, um, basically 30% cement and 70% um, eco-friendly aggregate. Um, and obviously we don't use any of the concrete that has things like uh, you know, mold reduction and other chemicals, because that would leach and cause probably fatalities within marine life. Um, and we speed the whole process up by doing what we call coral propagation. So here we see Maddie. Um, she's, I think, 13 or 14 years old. She's going to hate me if I got that wrong. But anyway, um, she's one of our younger uh, and very keen uh, gardeners. And what we can see here is our um, the previous version of our uh, what we call nursery tables. OK. Um, so these nursery tables um, are three point, well, three meters by 1.2 meters. And as you can see, they have, they're made of metal, the metal tables, and they have a grid on top of them. So our previous version, we'd be using these 25 mil grids. Um, but what we learned over time, as you can see, we don't plant them next to each other. We give them some space to grow. We were planting them 15 centimeters apart. The issue is, is that sponge and um, algae and, you know, other sort of uh, bits encrust themselves into these, into these holes. And what that does is two things. The first thing is it turns the whole tabletop into a sail. It's now solid. And so as soon as you start getting some surge and the sea starts getting a bit angry, now you've got the table that you know potentially can start lifting because you've given it something to lift. The second thing, which is far cuter and more fun, is as we started to get algae and stuff growing between the corals, firstly, it was a problem because that represents competition for the corals. Uh, but secondly, it became very attractive out to our local turtles who decided that this looked very much like a fast food restaurant and that what they'd love to do is to come along plonk themselves on top of it, have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a belly scratch and, you know, a nosh at the same time on all of the, uh, on all of the algae. Now, the issue with that is that all of our beautifully posed corals here that were all in order that we were measuring ended up getting thrown out everywhere by the turtles. And then we ended up with this big sort of jigsaw puzzle trying to work out which fragments went where, which obviously we couldn't. So we moved on to a far cleverer, solution which is to use 15 centimeter grids so now we've got big holes that stuff can't grow in we put a coral into each intersection and we've also designed a, a really clever um, index system that we can use um, to help us to document each coral individually um, we do part of that manually and we do part of that using um, photo quad um, analysis so this is basically using a camera that goes over the top of the table take a picture and then we use a uh, software and ai to uh, to work out what the uh, the growth is of the well various other things as well um so we have a simple methodology the first one is obviously sync it this is always quite useful 
um, for doing underwater stuff. So we sink the structure after building it. We build all the structures ourselves. We, we, we weld these things up as, uh, as part of the, the project. Um, we then go out, we collect naturally broken coral fragments from existing reefs. Now, this is very important because there are projects out there that will quite happily go out and rip a lovely big piece of very healthy coral that's well attached off of the reef, then go away and kind of chisel it into little pieces so that they can plant it onto their table. Now, if you're trying to do coral conservation, that's the equivalent of going into a forest, chopping down 20 oak trees so that you can plant the acorns. It just doesn't make any sense to us. So we don't do that. Um, branching coral, there are two different types, two main different mm -hmm. types of corals, I should say. You've got branching corals that look like trees, and then you've got massive corals, but the ones that look like brains or whatever, yeah? Um, the branching corals tend to break, you know, and it might be a big storm, or it might be bad divers that are kicking it, and as we saw last week, some tourists that were walking on them as they were pretending to snorkel, um, and you end up with fragments on the floor, okay, branches that have fallen off. Now, those branches will survive for a while. And our job is to get out there as divers and basically pick up all of the ones that we can that haven't bleached and all been covered over by uh, by sand. It's just like in the garden. If you buried a plant in the garden, you wouldn't expect it to live very long, same with coral. Um, so we check it for disease. Um, we make sure that it's a viable fragment. It all goes into a crate. We then take that crate off to our nurseries and plant them out as we saw earlier. Um, so, and if you meant, if you saw it, but uh, our uh, twenty five, our twenty five uh, mil grid tables, um, those had a capacity of about two hundred fragments. Uh, they took us seven hours underwater to collect and plant a table. So that's seven dives. It's quite a lot of time, quite a lot of effort. The ones we're doing now, um, just, as I said, obviously we've got bigger holes, and so we are now getting, I think, just about just under 130 fragments per table. Uh, and that takes us about five hours to collect and plant. So it's quite a laborious job. Um, so that's the propagation part. Um, you probably saw that, and if you did, I'll just flip backwards a second. You probably saw that we have all these little tubes here that we we're putting the, uh, the corals into. This was our version one. Um, those are rubber, garden hose tubes, three quarter inch garden hose tubes, which fit nicely into that 25 mil socket. <laughs> and then we just cut a sort of, uh, make a cut in the top of the, of the hose and then push the coral in and then push the tube in. And that would hold it quite comfortably and less turtle. Yeah, the Teenage Ninja Turtles came along for their algae pizza. Um, that doesn't work as a methodology with our new system with the 15, um, centimeter holes so we're now using wire to sort of firmly attach these things um, so that will that will happen on the tables and then what we'll do is we'll garden those for probably four to six months now when i say four to six months that is for the branching corals that we focus on so the main ones that we work with are um, acropora and Pacilipora. Um, they're relatively fast growing, or they're the faster growing corals that we have in our area. And so for our purposes, which is to preserve as much as we possibly can at this point in time, we're tending to go more with the uh, the faster growing corals than we still do something with the uh, the massive corals as well. But those things grow three, four millimeters a year. There are techniques that we can use to accelerate that, but that will involve us doing lab work on uh, on land, which we're probably going to start doing this year. But the main part of our work is on branching corals at this point in time, just for mass. Now, I mentioned El Nino before. The El Nino that started is has been categorized as strong. So that's like four out of five. The last time we had a strong one here was in 2016. And in 2016, sorry, the last one we had was 2015 to 2016. And in 2016, we had a massive bleaching event. So we're expecting to get the tail end of the ocean warming here this summer. 
That means that we have to sequester as much as possible off of the reef, the shallow reef, so the three to six metre reefs. We need to sequester as much coral as we can at greater depth. We're working around 12 metres, which is kind of like a fridge, if you like. It'll be slightly cooler and give it a bigger chance of surviving. So the more we can get down there, the better, uh, which is why we're working with the faster growing corals. So from there, once we've transplanted onto those nice animal structures, that then sits for 10 plus years before, as I mentioned, before it collapses and we end up with a, a reef. Okay. So uh, the project is made up of a network. So we do a lot of community building. Uh, I suppose we could consider part of what I'm doing tonight, community building, just helping people to understand what we do. We work with a number of corporate CSR partners who help us to fund uh, the, the project. We also work with some technical partners. We've got some, uh, some really fun uh, technological parts to the project that we're working on for this year, which include underwater Wi-Fi and drones and all sorts of stuff. So that should be really good fun. It's kind of my background as well. So we work with universities, schools, research centers, uh, and the government. So uh, from a coral gardener perspective, basically, if you want to work underwater 10 years old and up, so for those of you who have children, we can get them involved if they're divers, and if they're not, we can teach them. Uh, um, I think our oldest coral gardener is 78. We work with Mokai, so we've got a three-year agreement, uh, 23 to 25, uh, with them for research studies uh, on propagation and restoration of reefs uh, and various other bits and pieces. We also have a permit for three years from the Fujera Environment Authority that started in uh, October last year for phase two of the project. Uh, also for propagation, restoration of reefs. So no, I mentioned, here we go. There's the turtle coming to help. I knew he was in there somewhere. So what's interesting is that if a reef is healthy, it will attract life. And we've actually, I think we've recorded uh, around 110 different species on our phase one reef. Uh, and obviously large numbers of some of those species, but that was from nothing. There was nothing there except worms and a few crabs. And we, within nine months, we had more than 110 species, which is quite impressive. Now, what was even more impressive is that we started to get rare species. So here's one example. Uh, here's another. These are, these are frogfish. We do not see many frogfish. For those of you who dive here, you haven't seen many frogfish here. I mean, I've been diving here for 10 years and I've probably seen three. We've got four of them living on our reef. Now, what that does is demonstrates that the environment is extremely healthy and also well enough protected for these things to want to live there. So rare species indicate high biodiversity and health, which is, which is a great indicator for us. So the old Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second best time is now. So what I want to do is to invite you to watch. I can work out how to make this work, which involves putting glasses on. Okay. Why isn't this working? I have no idea. Here we go. Let's do that. Nope, doesn't want to do it. Okay, I'm going to play it like this.
It does get a bit jazzy now. <laughs> So that gives you an idea of the sort of thing where you basically went from sand to that in nine months, and it's just continued to populate and get the species attract species. Um, so I'm going to wrap up sort of over the next couple of slides. Um, the first 
phase was the pilot project um, and, and its objective was really for us to uh, to test out materials, test out methods, um, test out the optimal depth for doing the uh, the coral propagation. You know, as I mentioned, you've got a uh, you've got a kind of um, balance to find between available light and the water temperature in summer. So, from a temperature perspective, we want it to be as deep as we can because the deeper we go, the cooler it gets, the happier the coral is. From a light perspective, as you probably saw in the video, we have some greeny water sometimes, and sometimes it can be really green. I mean, two, two, three meters of visibility. Um, so it can't be too deep. Otherwise, the availability of light is not enough for photosynthesis. So we ended up around eight meters chart datum um, as sort of optimal. However, on the natural reefs, you can see, I mean, it's almost like a snow line on a mountain, a tree line on a mountain, I should say. Um, at about 12 meters, that's the sort of limit of significant numbers of hard coral growth. So we're doing a second site during phase two, which will be at 12 meters, so that we can test comparative growth. You know, by making it a bit deeper, does it make it grow slower effectively? Um, or are there any other effects that we didn't anticipate? Um, so the pilot project allowed us to test out all our construction methods. It allowed us to, to, to put together all of our, um, basically our scientific methods as well. You know, how we, how we measure, how we uh, monitor, inverse monitor and measure. Um, and we have actually um, started contributing to John Bird's program in terms of uh, monitoring data. Um, which is something that's happening right across the uh, well, this part of the Gulf at least. So um, we've all agreed. We had one of our uh, James, our head conservationist, who was down at NYU, um, Abu Dhabi, to for a week, where they all sort of thrashed out how they were going, what taxonomies they were going to use for monitoring and measuring methods, etc. So we're all using exactly the same approaches now uh, across multiple countries. Um, phase two. Uh, started in October, uh, we've already got a few structures down, but essentially what we're doing with this one um, is, wait, I may even have a, have, yeah, let me just go on to that. Uh, I've, I've got a slightly more detailed slide on that one. And phase three is not necessarily going to be a consecutive phase. Phase three may start midway through phase two, phase two being a three-year project. Uh, phase three, and this is uh, kind of exciting, but it's not 100% confirmed yet. I mentioned earlier that we'd identified the probability of a barrier reef. Phase three would be actually recreating that barrier reef down the coast of Fujera um, using a mixture of the structures that I mentioned already, so the metal structures, uh, some concrete structures as well but potentially also the use of uh, oyster shells within what we call gabion bags, which is essentially chicken wire bags or slightly stronger chicken wire bags. Uh, we've tested it already on phase one as a method and, and it works. Um, we were kind of scared that the bags would rot and we'd end up with an oyster tsunami across all of the hotel beaches, which we didn't think would be that popular. So it, it doesn't, it works. Um, so in phase two, part of what we're going to be testing is, I mentioned that we'll do an eight meter site and a 12 meter site. What we're also going to do is to create a, um, call it a highway between the two sites. And the reason we're going to do that is we want to determine whether that helps recruitment of the species from the initial site onto the second site. Because if we can join them up and, all the fish go, hey, this looks interesting. Let's take a walk down this sort of um, gray brick road as opposed to the yellow brick one and see what's at the other end of this. Now, we've got all our measurements from the first side that gives us the speed of recruitment, you know, over a two-year period. And so we'll have some data that we can use to compare the uh, the speed of recruitment to the 12-meter uh, the site from the new 8-meter uh, site. So that'll be interesting. And then we've got a, a bunch of other experiments, which I'll go through in a second. Um, so phase one, um, we put 35, well, we put more than 35 structures down, but as I mentioned, a bunch of them got trashed by the cyclone. 
Uh, 34, 35 surviving um, structures, just under 480 coral fragments. Um, we grew more than that, but we used them to, um, you know, to do some natural reef repairs as well. So um, we've got about just under 100 large transplanted coral colonies on that first uh, that first site before we ran out of permit time. Um, we tested the oyster gabion bags I mentioned. Uh, we trained up sort of 15 um, coral workers to help us. We also put in place a photopod measurement system, as I mentioned before, allows us to do photographic measurement of growth. Um, we got 128 schools involved, which was cool. Um, we ran a competition with Dubai 92, uh, 92 FM, um, to design an artificial reef. And we, I think we had about 3,000 entries, uh, which was wonderful, uh, ranging from five-year-olds who tore a page out of their coloring book and did some really neat inside the line coloring stuff, uh, all the way up to sort of 16, 17 year olds who were giving us CAD CAM pictures with like uh, scientific briefs and things, amazing work. Um, and we built, in fact, this was the winner um, that we built. Um, didn't necessarily win because of the shape, but you should have seen the document these girls put together, it was insane. Um, 23 funding sponsors at that point in time. Uh, we did a lot of media outreach, uh, outreach and public awareness as well, just to sort of tell people what we were doing. Phase two, um, I mentioned we'll have a eight meter site with probably 80 to 100 structures on it. Um, we've already got around the, we've got, I want to say about 40, 45 that um, are ready to go that we built, but we couldn't sink on the previous site. Um, we're going to construct the second deeper site. We're going to build a link between the two, as I mentioned. Then we've got some um, isolated experimentation sites uh, at different depths. So some of the things that we need to test out are if we're going to build this Gabion wall, we have to remember that we've got currents in the ocean and currents carry sediment and ca currents carry food. So what we don't want to do is create a disturbance that is going to cause, for example, a lee where there's either a lot of sediment that accumulates or a lack of food. And so what we'll be doing is putting uh, tables on either side of the, uh, you know, different heights and, and stuff um, along each side of the, um, the Gabion wall to test out some of those things. Um, and then we've got another um, eight, another bunch of experiments around growth and uh, marine life colonization as well as uh, some studies on turtle behavior. We'll be doing those, I think, with um, for gerogenetics. Um, we're going to be doing some turtle tagging and tracking and stuff like that. Um, all that data gets put together quarterly, and uh, we share that with uh, various scientific institutions as well as the government. And we're going to continue doing promotion and education and stuff like that. So that's uh, kind of cool. And uh, if anyone's interested, then I shall leave that up so you can point your phone at it and go onto our website um where there's a lot more information that i was able to give you today uh and at that point it's time for me to stop talking and start listening if we have time do we have time for questions i mean i know we're probably running to the end here but uh I've been in the dark here. I can't see anyone. <laughs> yes, please. So, Andrew, you're going to be and I Excellent question. So, um, this is actually a, this is a subject that is at the root of a lot of debate in the scientific community, at least, in terms of, are, are artificial reefs good or evil? And one of the key reasons that people think that artificial reefs might be damaging is because they can, if the methods are not good, reduce biodiversity. Now, I mentioned that there are two ways of uh, reproduction for corals. So you've got sexual reproduction once a year, and then you've got fragmentation as the sexual reproduction method. If you take coral fragments 
from a 10 by 10 area and then put all of those onto the same table. The chances are that you are actually taking the same coral, the same coral family from the same species. And if you keep doing that, then the biodiversity will be, or sorry, the genetic diversity, not the biological diversity, the genetic diversity will be reduced over time for inbreeding. That's exactly what it is. So what we have done uh, is put together um, our methodology to ensure that when we're collecting, we're collecting from very different parts of the reefs, and then we are actually putting them onto uh, tables that have deliberately been varied. So we're going to go a step further. I hope to go a step further this year. Um, I met with uh, the Geogenetics last week, and one of the things that they promised to do for me is genetic sampling, so random genetic sampling on our tables to ensure that we are not going down a a bit of a bottleneck genetically. So we'll actually have some data that we can, uh, we can prove that, which is good. But great question. Is the way, the way, the way you've got the nurseries, is that a protected area? It was on phase one. Because now, <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest, what, we, we're not publishing the location of the site. Um, so that's already one thing. It is far away from any touristy site. It's far away from it's least a kilometer away from any other dive site. Partly deliberate because we don't want to have, um, you know, when we start measuring recruitment of species, we want to make sure that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul, because that's the other big argument against producing artificial reefs is how can you be sure that you're increasing biodiversity? Because you could just be taking all of the species from the natural reef over here, and they're coming to populate this artificial reef because they like the houses better, more modern. Right? So we've deliberately put that up out of the way in the middle of nowhere. Now, boys, which we have to have boys on the surface to be able to identify where the place is, obviously that attracts some tension and our biggest concern at this point is contingent fishing to us. Because as soon as they work out that we're aggregating species and fish, they're going to be interested, obviously. Now, I'm talking to, um, well, I'm talking, I'm not sure that we're at a point where we're really having a proper conversation yet, but I started talking to um, the uh, environmental authorities in Kujera just to say, guys, so we do need to do something about the uh, sort of fishing protection, particularly, um, because otherwise the scientific results are going to be a bit skewed if we end up with both anchors being uh, thrown on top of our tables. So, ongoing conversation, and I hope it will find a solution. Yeah. Actually, how do you find the right spot? Um, Okay, so we have a documenting checklist of exactly what we want in terms of environment, depth, um, location. There, there are a bunch of sort of, I won't go into detail now, but there are a bunch of sort of no-nos and a bunch of yes, we like this kind of um, points. And so um, we did a lot of pre-diving sort of uh, different areas to make sure that we were selecting something that would be good or hopes would be good for what we were doing. Um, and then before we confirmed this site, although uh, that was an interesting story in itself, which I won't go into now, but we had to do um, an environmental impact assessment as well. So it was a three month uh, full on um, scientific analysis, baseline analysis of the area, including you know, chemical uh, inform and benthic analysis. And, Species analysis and transects and all sorts of stuff, you know, to produce the data that we need to prove that we weren't going to be creating any issues and that what we were doing was good. So that was a uh, heavyweight. I think. Uh, do you want to okay. um, You mentioned the a few times and you just talked about that which might into regulations. So, what existing regulations are there and what might still be needed? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, all right, so the regulations that are here are mainly federal. 
Um, so there are two laws that include points that specifically mention uh, artificial reefs. Uh, if anyone's interested, then get in contact with me and I will send you the documents if you're interested in any of the text. Um, and, and typically what happens is that the, the Emirates then inherit those federal laws and apply them in you know, the, the way that they want to. Um, generally speaking, from what I've seen in the ocean, uh, certainly in the Northern Emirates, they tend to take the uh, federal text as is uh, and don't really embellish them too much. Um, so there is stuff in there about what you are and aren't allowed to do from a, an artificial perspective. Um, one of the things being is that you're not actually allowed to put artificial reefs in place unless you are a research establishment or part of a fisheries commission or in partnership with the government. The other thing is that you're not allowed to create artificial reefs unless you have an environmental permit, which is something that is um, ignored um, in certain cases. Um, you know, there are people doing projects that just don't have the permit. I decided to do it correctly. Um, we have to fight for quite a number of months to, to get that sorted out. So um, it's not easy. The other thing which is covered is the uh, the role of marine protected areas. So there are laws around what can and can't happen in a marine protected area. Um, typically, as you would imagine, given the topography of the country, the areas that have a lot of coal tend to be the ones that got selected as, as NPS. Um, which means that it restricts theoretically what you are allowed to do. However, the monitoring of that is uh, not uh, a regular thing, let me put it that way. So there are there are breaches, uh, regular breaches of marine protected area uh, laws. Okay, it's a, this is a really complex topic to be honest. So I'm not sure if I can really talk much more about that now, but I'm happy to sort of have that conversation offline. Is there an international precedent protocol for what you're doing at the dimension tables where where the quotes are you propagating this kind well, of thing? And are there are there different results or are you doing groundbreaking work of what you're doing? Yeah, so the um none of what I've showed you today is um proprietary. I mean, there are projects that are using nursery tables, that are using artificial reef structures, etc. However, the, the key to success, and we learned that, uh, I've got people who worked in South Africa, worked in Thailand, and stuff like that, working with projects, um, with employees and, and scientists. And uh, the one thing that's become clear is that one size does not fit all. You know, a structure that would work very well in the lagoon in uh, in the Bahamas, get smashed to pieces in five seconds here. Um, you'll see stuff going on in uh, New Caledonia, for example, where they're using ropes. Um, so they're tying lines of ropes and then sort of twisting the rope the wrong way and inserting pieces of coal into it. It was fine over there. If I did that here, it would like me, it would be like me taking granny's knitting and throwing it all into a sort of big pile and hoping to untangle it. Uh, it, it would get It'd be all over the place just because of the way that the ocean values here. Um, you know, we did some tests and it just doesn't work. So there are principles and there are lots and lots of papers and stuff out there that talk about different methods. And if you want to succeed, then you've really got to take all of that knowledge and then try to apply it within the actual physical environment that you're working with. Stuff that works uh, where you've got limited water down to 30 meters doesn't work when you've got you know maximum eight meters that you can work in, and even then sometimes you know you're working with visibility that's a meter and a half. Horses for courses. So the key is selecting the right tools for job. We are going to, I can't talk about it in any detail because I'm under long disclosure, but we are being we are starting um to work on some more technological innovations for this year, uh, which I hope will be groundbreaking, um, particularly around the sort of monitoring side uh, for coral. One of the biggest issues, I think, realizations, certainly some of my sponsors, was 
They went to COP28 and everyone was very keen to sort of talk about what they achieved, but when they were inside the spectrum line, you know, they, they don't have the data that they need to be able to really quantify the benefits that they made. And I think everybody's sort of crying out for a better way of, of monitoring under undersea activities. It, it's very limited at this point, and uh, you know that accuracy is less than what one would like. In an ideal world. So, we're going to be working on that. We've got two years to start to check those companies that will come together to have some fun. All right, I need to come to you because you've been waiting. Well, I'm sure it's time to scale up the project. Is that like in a feasibility cluster or then more? Um, well, I mean, we're already jumping. So, we had 100 meters by 100 meters for phase one. So, um, and now we're probably going to be around 200 by 500. So we're already scaling up 10 times um, for phase two. Uh, the, the key, one of the byproducts of uh, the phase two project is also for us to be able to measure the amount of time, elapsed time, and the amount of effort it takes us to do, let's say, a kilometer so that we can validate our estimates for this phase three project, which would be going down a significant number of kilometers on the coastline. So, um, yeah, I mean, we are increasing tenfold in phase three, in phase two, in phase three, with the, um, if we do the entire coastline, the current estimate is a 12 year project. So, yeah, that could probably be, uh, probably be sort of retirement. <laughs> From your experience so far, do you see patterns in the species kinds of coral that are that are colonizing? Are you are you starting to get everything, or would you expect everything? Is there a is there so, a like, like the forest? Is there a sequence where certain certain plants come in early, and others you would only expect later? Yeah. So I mean. Um... From a coral perspective, obviously it's us that's bringing the coral there. So we're we're only putting asexually reproduced coral onto the site at this point. Um, hopefully, at some point, you know, they'll the corals are mature enough so that they can actually create their own planula larva and uh, and start you know populating um, themselves. But it's going to be hard to measure that we don't, we don't in, a, in an open do environment. But you do colonizing. So what we've been focusing on in terms of recruitment and uh, and colonization has been the species that um, come to live on the, the coral reef. And that we have been looking at. So it's pretty much what we would expect. Um, the, the initial recruitment was um, mainly herbivores. Um, and if you're interested, I've got a very detailed list of all of the uh, all of the species and sort of the order that they uh, they arrived in. But essentially, it was mainly herbivores, and that was because, um, as well as you know, because we put structures in there to put the coral on, we ended up with a lot of algae and stuff, uh, algae and sponge that started to grow there as well. As I mentioned, we you know we have quite a sort of rich, nutrient-rich environment, um, which encourages the algae growth and. Um, Obviously, as soon as there's uh, as soon as there's veggie food, then the herbivores start turning up, and so we got what we kind of expected. Um, the other population that grew were all of the uh, the sort of maintenance population, um, you know, things like porcelain crabs and uh, also the predators as well, pupella snails and things like that turned up fairly fairly quickly, um, and. You know, there were other sort of uh, events that were important, things like um, cleaning stations being established there. Um, so, you know, blue, blue stripe wrasse and stuff like that, rocking up so that they could uh, offer their um, their spa service to the other denizens of the reef. Um, but yeah, I, it, there is an order to it. And the thing is, as I think I mentioned before during the, the talk, the um, when you're creating a new ecosystem in the middle of nowhere, um, the, 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 the real question that we're realizing is, at what point does that ecosystem become balanced? Because for it to be balanced, you know, obviously the food chain needs to build itself to the top. So once you get a bunch of herbivores, if you don't get predators of the herbivores, then we're going to end up with an overpopulation of herbivores. Um, 
So it, it then becomes a question of how quickly uh, uh, the, the, the carnivores um, identifying that there's a new food source. And, you know, as you saw, you saw a bunch of things like raves and stuff like that that had turned up on the other side, but they took a little while to arrive because the food source wasn't big enough for them to uh, to bother themselves before that. But we do have a calendar um, and uh, a chronology of that. If you're interested, I'm happy to uh, to share that. Sure. Really the location. I think you would have been very valuable, I'm not sure. Whether also, you know, of the fragments that grow from the crystal and get from that. But what they were doing is they, in addition to also having no trees or having the sweet pebbles underwater, they had some on land that they were yeah. enjoying. Mm -hmm. So that in case there's another event, it's not. Okay, so there's two there's two sides to that. Um, so we're more concentrating from a sort of biobank perspective, we're more doing the in situ stuff, so in the water. Um, we can put stuff in tanks, and there's um, a new facility that's just opened up in um, on the other side of Port, um, which is a company called Coral Meter, who we've been talking to for quite some time. So they created a little sort of lab um, with tanks and stuff like that. Um, so that's one thing we're putting to work with them to bring you some, some coral. Mm -hmm. um, the second side to this, which we're probably doing, Jera, is. Um, I mentioned that the slower growth crops, uh, you know, like rows of two to four five years. Um, there's something that's a technical macro fragmentation. And essentially, what this is is you take your uh, your slow growing coral, and what you'll do is then cut it into small slices, bone saw. Okay. Those small slices will then mount onto uh, ceramic little ceramic cups. And then place them within a few centimeters of each other. And what happens is instead of growing a millimeter to three millimeters or five millimeters, whatever it is per year, they actually accelerate growth to rejoin. And so that's one of the ways that we can accelerate the, the growth of the, you know, the massive corals. And that's something that we do want to do. Uh, I'm just waiting for our own to get their tanks and stuff so we can have them as We'll also be doing that with uh, the post time. You running out of time? I, I was, I, I thought you were going to take another question, and I was going to say, uh, there was another question. Let's, let's, make, let's make that the last one, and uh, people people can, can get you. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's one more. Yeah, and you've got a lot more, but I'll be uh, after. So, one question which came up which was about other Emirates, things like Abu Dhabi. What activities do you have there? Is there other opportunities to volunteer? Uh, uh, no, um, I, I don't work in Abu Dhabi uh, at, at this point in time. We don't work in Dubai. And that, that was actually a conscious choice. Um, Abu Dhabi, where we had some projects running, uh, we did an environmental impact assessment uh, a year and a half ago in Dubai. And honestly, the, the state of the waters here. And the temperatures that we're reaching during summer uh, on the Arabian seaside, we don't think we can be successful here at this point in time. Uh, potentially in the future, but right now we've got focus on something where we know we can have a great impact. There is um, another project that we're working with finally, which would be more in the uh, Al Quay area, because uh, Mokai actually have their uh, research center there. Um, that would involve uh, mangroves, seagrass, coral, potentially uh, poisons as well. Uh, and essentially recreating that the four natural layers of filtration and foliar protection the way they originally thought they would be. Then now we've unsaturated, and there are very few places where they pre exist the diversity of mangroves from seagrass to these centers. So that's something that would be a part of the planning, and that may very well be too much. But otherwise, you know, the concentration of this is part of the pollution. Can you imagine how much work we've got to, to replace 10 hectares of uh, what it takes you seven hours to do on the table? Yeah. Got a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. But, so, so, whilst, I mean, you've, you've created quite a burden for yourself. 
to expand that quickly, where are you going to get all those small patterns from? Um, actually, that's not an issue. Um, finding that bulk reference is what well, finding that bulk is, is mm -hmm. that's a far bigger problem to find the resources to do it. So, now, you know, if I look at the sort of um, bottlenecks, that's it. Um, you know, at this point in time, uh, there's no alternative to putting people under water, and you've got an hour, hour and a half per student tank. Um, well, you do it for three meters, yeah. and then you stay for a couple of hours, and then you well, that's the thing working at the working at least 12 meters. And then, uh, I actually work with three tanks, so I can yeah, do it for right. ages, or yeah. three years. but uh, yeah, and that, that's really the restriction. So, people, because we can only do a certain number of flights per day as well, so. What's the season? Season. Um, all year. Yeah, July, August. All the all the time. And the experience. Yeah. 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 We also have an uh, education system for all of the different. So there is a course that you can do, which is partly online and then partly in Giver, two days, um, where you learn more on the background of the whole you know, how technology works. You need to understand the environment you're working within. Um, and then a very practical hands on, you know, this is how you do it. You know, all the methods, monitoring, planting, transplanting. Let me come out for yeah. Let's let's take you uh, off with well, it's an extremely interesting presentation. Obviously, many people, probably most people here, will know the the areas in question, even if they aren't. Uh, Divers, and we're all hoping and yeah, hoping the best for the coral. I, I, it, it, we normally will leave you with a memento or so, and then one has been suggested to me by, by our uh, uh, librarian. Uh, this is a, a volume, I don't know if you know, Tribulus is the, uh, the, the local uh, uh, scientific journal of the uh, natural history groups. This particular one has a number of. Uh, uh, Marine articles, so it was suggested. Uh, very nice. Thank you so much. With, uh, with that, thank, thank you, you very much. You <clears throat> for more information, you have the you can scan if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I might oh. they scan if you want. There we are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 For uh, John Bird, who is not going to be talking uh, specifically about coral, but I suspect some coral information will uh, will slip in. He's going to be, uh, uh, I think, presenting some highlights from the uh, from the big book that's uh, recently published.